he said, well, you can't go after Jim Jones. You can't go after Jim Jones? Correct. And he said, do you realize who Jim Jones is? That's what the San Francisco district attorney told senior investigator David Rubin as he was trying to build a criminal case against the Reverend Jim Jones. This is Oversight, CQ Roll Call's podcast where we re-examine our nation's scandals through the prism of congressional investigation. We're doing this at a moment when congressional oversight is again gripping the nation. I'm Sheila McVicker, and this episode reveals how political corruption enabled Jim Jones to get away with extortion, assault, and sexual abuse. More than a year before the Jonestown Massacre, while Jim Jones was still in San Francisco, people came forward to accuse Jones of serious crimes. We could not understand why we couldn't find evidence of any law enforcement investigation. Then we found David Rubin, a former hotshot senior investigator in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. When I called and explained what we were working on, he said, I've been waiting for this call for 41 years. The story began when Al and Jeannie Mills, the original People's Temple whistleblowers, walked into his office early in 1977. That's before all the bad press on Jones came out. What did they tell you? They started unfolding a story of corruption and drug use, weapons, uh, beatings, kidnappings, the taking of money from families, um, extortion, uh, you name it. We couldn't write fast enough, I recall, at the time. And then what happened? Well, we were pretty stunned. They they sat with us for quite a while. And, and I, I think one of our early comments was, well, why haven't you gone to the FBI? Why haven't you gone to the police department? Uh, why haven't you gone to any of these other agencies that you are pretty much identifying as the relevant agency for those types of crimes. And their answer? We did. We went to all those agencies, and they don't want to talk to us. Do you know the reason why those other agencies, the San Francisco Police Department or the FBI, did not want to listen to what Al and Jeannie Mills had to say? There had been a lot of um, uh, negative press, shall we say, that the FBI had received because of their intelligence they were gathering on public figures. Martin Luther King, the Kennedys, etc. So they were a little more touchy about what they wanted to take on. And Jones was connected. And Jones was going to be a hot-button topic, and there's no doubt about it. There's another reason for the FBI to avoid investigating beyond a local political hot potato, and that's the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It ensures freedom of religion, and American law enforcement historically has been reluctant to take on and investigate allegations of abuses or criminality on the part of organizations that hide behind the word church. So what did you and your, your fellow investigators do? After initially getting over, well, are these crackpots or not, they had enough specifics and established their credibility enough that we thought, this is certainly worth pursuing. So just to be clear about the date, this is in 1977. Correct. I would have to say it would be early to mid-1977. Okay. And what did you find as you began to look at this? There were potentially serious crimes that were being committed and that People's Temple was not what they were representing themselves to be. Serious crimes? Serious crimes. Can you tell me what the crimes were? Well, the crimes were beatings of uh, children and adults on a regular basis, uh, extorting people, uh, that forcing them to stay in people's temple once they were there, taking people's money, social security checks, uh, all their worldly goods and assets were given over to people's temple. So when we realized we may be onto something here, and it was potentially a dynamite situation, then we went in to see our boss, the DA. This is still in early 1977, when Jim Jones was at the height of his power and celebrity in San Francisco. The district attorney was Joe Freitas. He was elected, a Democrat, and just like Jim Jones, a fixture in the machine politics of San Francisco's political scene. We were excited. Here was 
major figure, at least locally. Jim Jones. Jim Jones. And the DA said? We're kind of set back because he said, well, you can't go after Jim Jones. You can't go after Jim Jones? Correct. And he said, do you realize who Jim Jones is? You know, and Jim Jones is is a well-revered local figure. Um, I've met him. This is the district attorney talking. Um, people in our office have met him. Mayors met him. Members of city council have met him. Um, and other political figures. But it was like, you don't just take on somebody like that because two potentially crackpot people come in and make a bunch of outrageous allegations. Here's something else David Rubin told us about his boss. The DA, Joe Freitas, was one of the many politicians who cozied up to Jim Jones. It speaks volumes about the level of corruption and cronyism in San Francisco. This is a man, Freitas, who is a supporter of People's Temple, really, at the time. Just the fact that my boss, the district attorney, went to meetings on occasion, even went as far as I recall to L.A. to a meeting once, um, speaks for itself. What happened after the DA said to you, you cannot go after Jim Jones? You know, we didn't want to stand down. Um, and we were pretty stubborn ourselves. Um, and the, the conclusion was kind of along the line of low key, do what you needed to follow up on the easy stuff, but be real careful. I don't want this blowing up. I don't want this being an embarrassment. You come back to me with some solid cases. Maybe we'll talk about it. But we left that meeting thinking we don't have the support of our boss. What happened next? We investigated. We followed up on the whole branch of allegations of different types. A lot of it we had to delineate to, well, this really falls under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Things like smuggling of weapons, um, currency violations. FBI, there was no interest. Um, they weren't going to look at it. So the FBI had heard allegations from whistleblowers and has now heard more allegations from another law enforcement agency. It wasn't that the FBI didn't know there might be something going on. They just didn't care. In fact, there's a cable from the director of the FBI to the Secretary of State saying, quote, the activities of the People's Temple Church were not investigated by the FBI. Of course, that changed after more than 900 people died in Guyana. But for Rubin and his team through 1978, the scope of the investigation was expanding. In terms of your own investigation, do you remember what the strands were that you were following? We looked at homicides, child abduction, property extortion, arson, battery, drugs, welfare diversion, uh, notary violations, kidnapping. Uh, they already were lawyered up. Jones was lawyered up. Uh, he had a, an attorney I remember uh, named Charles Gary, uh, who was a well-known local uh, criminal defense attorney. Uh, and the lawyer for the Black Panthers. Yes, he was. And um, Charles Gary was, <laughs> was going to make sure we received no cooperation from anybody that he represented. And he represented basically the People's Temple and other members. So uh, that stonewalled a lot of follow-up. Stonewalling was everywhere, especially inside the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. Joe Freitas wanted an answer right away. He didn't want us having this dangling out there. I think he was concerned about a potential political embarrassment. I mean, if we were all wet and there was nothing here and word came out that he was investigating Jim Jones, but I think he saw his political career being affected. He was a politician. So we gave a status memo that was pretty much, as we call the later recover your ass memo, um, that said, well, here's the following 20 areas that we have looked at. We have not made enough to establish a criminal case yet. There's still some pending issues. But for right now, this is where we're at. And Freitas pretty much said, okay, we're done. That's it? Yeah. You guys don't need to really mess around with this anymore. So we went back and said, well, we're still going to keep this alive. I mean, we could, at that point, we, we had dug our heels in. We had established too many connections. And we had 
people who were counting on us to do the right thing. The main goal they all had was, we have family members still in there, we got, we got to get them out because this is only going to go further south. We were being told over and over again that this is going to end up badly, um, that this man is basically a sociopath and um, he has protection of people and he will do things that are going to end up worse than they are now. Reuben and his team ignored their boss and continued to poke around. Meanwhile, there was a mole inside the DA's office. All of a sudden, we are informed that we have a new attorney assigned to our unit named Tim Stone. Um, okay. And more resources. I mean, that's fabulous. We told our informants that we have new resources that are going to assist us, so that's encouraging. Oh, who are the new resources? Another attorney. That's great. Who is that? Tim Stone. Our credibility immediately took a, a big dive because it was like, what are you talking about? Tim Stone. He's the number two in the organization. He's maybe the most loyal People's Temple member. He's the legal advisor. And we went in to see Freitas. And we said, uh, what's going on? And uh, he said, you guys, no, 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 that's not the case. He denied that, that Stone was a member of the People's Temple or had any association with Jones. He certainly denied that he was his legal advisor. A lawsuit filed by the People's Temple against Tim Stone says that he was the lawyer for the People's Temple until August of 1977, months after the DA denied exactly that. For all those months, Tim Stone served two masters, the DA and Jim Jones. Was Stone in the DA's office as a result of influence by Jim Jones? I would say the answer to that is absolutely. It was unbelievable that he was not only working in our office, but had now been told to assist us on the People's Temple investigation. When I look back at this 41 years ago, I mean, if that's not the most blatant part of the uh, insurrection of People's Temple into the local political structure, I don't know what else would be. I mean, if you told that to any investigator anywhere, they, <laughs> they, they'd laugh. What happened to your investigation? We, we were pushing for a grand jury. I remember even at the time. Let's have a grand jury. Just so everybody understands, at a grand jury, what would the jury have heard? Well, we would have demanded that we would have subpoenaed everybody in and we would have been forced to testify in, in, under oath in a grand jury and we would have been seeking more information, obviously, and that would include the People's Temple, current People's Temple members, which we had been stonewalled on. But that the grand jury is, is a powerful tool of a district attorney. And I think in any other time, in any other situation, it would have been worthy of a grand jury investigation. Um, in an objective environment that would have occurred. And it didn't occur here because? Because our bosses said, we're not having a grand jury. We're not doing it. It's that simple. End of story. End of conversation. If your investigation had been allowed to continue, and if the DA had agreed to hold a grand jury, do you think indictments could have been brought that could have led to the extradition of Jim Jones? It was a major investigation with major allegations, with unbelievable scenarios that were being presented to us. It's a high profile figure in a good situation, in the proper right situation. We would have been given all the resources we needed. Investigations of this magnitude certainly would have warranted that. There was too much, in the words of Chicago, ease, too much juice out there that he had. He was too connected. I mean, who was going to take him down? It wasn't going to be a little investigative unit out of the DA's office. That became pretty clear. Could the feds have taken him down? Maybe. Maybe. They certainly had the resources. They certainly had the authority and the power that we didn't have. They weren't interested until 
after the fact. And then, of course, the irony there is after Jonestown, after November of 1978, we got a lot of, why didn't you guys do more? This is our fault. This is your fault. Our fault. Our investigative unit, because we were on top of investigating it. How come we couldn't put this together? How come we couldn't make a case? This is something David Rubin has lived with for 41 years. And your answer? We tried. We did what we could do. We have declassified FBI telegrams sent to the director of the FBI shortly after the deaths in Jonestown. They show there was a conspiracy in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. The FBI reported the People's Temple backed the election of the district attorney, that the DA did hire Tim Stone as a deputy DA, confirmed that Tim Stone monitored the People's Temple investigation Rubin was working on, and reported progress of the investigation to Jim Jones. District Attorney Joe Freitas died in 2006. Freitas always claimed that a state attorney general investigation of Tim Stone's employment cleared him of wrongdoing. There's one more declassified FBI telegram to note here. Dated December 12, 1978, three and a half weeks after the mass murders and suicides at Jonestown, when the FBI has finally begun an investigation. It says, quote, The Bureau has been advised that San Francisco DA has personally shown unusual interest in this case. Sources indicate he is gravely concerned that prior violations discovered at this time may implicate himself or personnel in his office. No one, including Tim Stone or any other public official, was ever charged with any crimes committed in the United States. Tim Stone left the People's Temple sometime in late 1977. The exact date is unclear. Stone retired this year from the legal profession. We reached out to him several times. He never responded. In the next episode of Oversight Jonestown, we tell the story of a whistleblower who warned American diplomats about Jones's intent to kill. We also hear how a six-year-old American boy, the son Tim Stone claimed as his own, was central to the fate of the People's Temple. And there's a surprise appearance by the KGB station chief. Stay with us. Thanks for listening. If you haven't, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Oversight Jonestown was reported and written by me and Joanne Levine. This episode was produced by Micaela Rodriguez. Editing on this series by Joanne Levine with an assist from Martha Ann Overland. Fact-checking by Noah Berman. Oversight Jonestown could not have happened without the reporting help and insights of our CQ colleagues, Mark Strickerts and Marsha Myers. A huge shout-out to Jillian Roberts for her tireless support. If you visit our website at rollcall.com forward slash Jonestown, you'll see a beautiful design by Marnie Price. It was built by Patrick Blinghorn, Rajiv Manath, and Tom Schaefer. Oversight is a production of CQ Roll Call.